Good morning. We're going to start a little bit different. Uh, we're going to start with announcements today, and then we'll move into our song service. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody that's here, both uh, with us in person and online, and I hope that uh, today is fulfilling for you. We have a message from God's Word. We'll sing together and commune together, uh, and we'll offer up prayers. I have just a couple of announcements. Uh, the first thing is, if you notice, the stage is empty. Schultz Lewis, Schultz Lewis came this week and uh, with a big van and they picked all of our stuff up and they were very, very happy. It says, thank you so much. This is a note from Schultz Lewis. Thank you so much for your participation in our commodity program. We cannot thank you enough for collecting items for the kids. Your support is a blessing to the children and families we serve for the kids and it signed the development team, Schultz, Schultz Lewis. So uh, happy to do that. And uh, going forward in this month, if you notice there's some mason jars, oh, I thought this one had something in it, but uh, there is one back there that has, a, has some uh, change in it, and this says Changing Lives Spring Mill Bible Camp. So our month of June fundraiser or support is for Spring Mill Bible Camp. And if you wanna <clears throat> pick up a mason jar and put your change in it wow. as, or, or dollar bills. Yeah, dollar bills will fit in there. You just take the cap off and you just stuff them down in there. Uh, and then we'll collect, uh, we'll collect all that and probably match some of it and send a check then to, to Spring Mill Bible Camp. And uh, they are having their uh, first session. We'll start week after next, I think. And uh, <clears throat> really excited that uh, the board's really excited that they're able to offer two brand new cabins, one on the boys' side, one on the girls' side, that will be the uh, first time that they've been this year. And so, and uh, your contributions will really go to support all of the extra efforts that are going into having camp this this season because of the extra cleaning and smaller sizes. Uh, we're limiting the the number of campers to about 70-ish at most of the sessions, and uh, they normally could handle it uh, at up to about 125. So pretty significant reduction in, uh, in camp size, and everything has changed, literally. I mean, you know, can we go and uh, swim at Spring Mill Park? Who knows? You know, there are just so many things that are up in the air. So. Uh, your contributions will be uh, put to good use and we still have about six more cabins to build over over time at the cost of about a hundred and forty or fifty thousand dollars a piece so uh, we'll be doing that and, and proceeding uh, you know with whatever we can as the funding becomes available but really excited for uh, actually gonna have camp this year and uh, your contributions will uh, will be uh, a blessing to the camp I have two other announcements. One, uh, you may have heard, gotten an email, Bob Lampton is in the hospital, and uh, so just prayers for him and Winnie. And Winnie, how's he doing? About the same. Yeah, they picked his blood pressure under control. Okay. Yeah, so some blood pressure issues, and so just uh, pray for Bob and for Winnie. and. Uh, pray that he gets back his health and then also we just wanted to mention we've been praying for Glenn's sister uh, who is Barbara Wilson who is in hospice care and uh, she passed away this week so let's remember that family in our prayers as well uh, any other announcements Jim and Anna have some news. oh Jim and Anna have some news what's the news Jim and Anna Remy Love Sturgeon, a new granddaughter. Congratulations. That's exciting. All right. Let's let's worship our God. Thank you, Tracy. 
be live. It's a lot of special things going on, and uh, appreciate it. Uh, appreciate everybody. You would. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. song is Lamentations 3, verses 22 through 24. So if you're uh, uh, wondering, that is uh, almost word for word, as uh, Jeremiah wrote. Sam, is yep. this next song the one that the words didn't show up after so far? We got so far along, and we all of a sudden, they quit changing pages? I think it probably is. We're, this is our second <laughs> This is our second try at this one. There was a... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for reminding me of that uh, terrible event there. Uh, no, I appreciate that. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim, all his hosts together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high, praise him, O ye men of heaven, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory. Yeah. 
earth and sky. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. It's my honor today to say the opening prayer, but before I do, I would like to invite all of you at, at 9.30 on Sunday morning to join us for Bible study. Next week will be our third week, and Glenn does a fantastic job. He, our, our study next week is going to be on Job, so if you've got the patience of Job, you might want to join us. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, bless these great people that come here Sunday to worship you and to worship your Son. Lead us through this this terrible world that that it, it's in turmoil, full of hate, full of sin, full of evilness, and the devil is the one leading that. We know that you and your son are more powerful than the devil. Give give us the strength to fight back. Do not listen to there's 23 different types of people. There's 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 just Christians and non-Christians. We need to fight. We need to struggle, and we need to save our children. We need to do the very best we can to lead our children out of this darkness back into your light. In your son's name I pray, amen. amen. As most of you know, tomorrow is Memorial Day. And I think um, sometimes the, the importance of that day gets lost with um, all the, sell, all the uh, sales and things like that. And it's also Memorial Day has become the first, considered the first day of summer. But it wasn't always that way. Memorial Day was actually began after the Civil War. 
it was actually originally called Decoration Day, and it was not a legal holiday, but it was a time when people gathered at the grave of their loved one at, and decorated with flowers or cleaned up the area after winter. And it was about, it was, it was, to, it was, to, it was to remember their, um, their loved ones who died in the Civil War. And over time, it, uh, it grew and more states, it was just, uh, more states began to adopt it. And then eventually it was um, made a national holiday. Memorial Day is set aside for those veterans who have lost their lives in the service of their country. The key is they've lost their lives. There's also Armed Forces Day, but that's for so current soldiers that are serving. And then there are, there's Veterans Day, where we honor those soldiers who returned that are still with us. So the whole concept of Memorial Day was to focus on those who died. And it's, Memorial Day is celebrated yearly. And, it, and, we, and we talk about who's benefited from that, that's us. We've all benefited from what those soldiers did to protect our country. And it has since grown through World War I and World War II, Korean War, the Vietnam, the Vietnam conflict. But it was all about protecting our country and protecting our lifestyle. And because of that, they gave their lives. And we, each year we remember those, those people who didn't want to do it. I'm sure they didn't want to go to war, but they did. And they wanted to protect us from evil. So I think at this time, that's why we focus on Memorial Day. But as Christians, we also have our own Memorial Day. And that was, it actually began not like our Memorial Day after Civil War, but ours was began on the night of Jesus' betrayal. And that's when he instituted the Lord's Supper, the thing that we come to each Sunday, the first day of the week, to remember. It's all about remembering. And it's for us Christians to remember what Jesus did. You know, we remember that gift that he willingly left a perfect place to come to earth, an imperfect place. And he, knowing when he came, before he left heaven, that he would eventually die for our sins on the cross. And I like to think of this, this idea that it wasn't those horrible nails that kept him up there. It wasn't those nails. It was his love for us. Amen. That's what did it. So when we come together every Sunday, it's to remember. It's to focus on what Jesus didn't want to do it, but he willingly did it because of his love for us. And I want to read from 1 Corinthians, and then we will partake of the Lord's Supper. Sorry, Sorry, stay where I am. Um, we'll partake of the Lord's Supper after I read this. I, I will read it, have a prayer, and then we can take of the Lord's Supper. But this is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 23. For I received from the Lord, which I also passed to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after, he supper, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink, eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Will you pray with me, please? Our Lord and Father in heaven, as we partake of this communion, this Lord's Supper that you provided for us as a remembrance, we want to focus on your love. We want to focus on your willingness to come to earth, your willingness to die for us. 
your willingness to endure something so cruel that we could never experience it. Lord, we thank you for all this. As we partake of this, this bread, may we remember your body. As we partake of this juice, may we, think, may we remember the blood that was sacrificed for us, Lord. Lord, we love you so much. But Lord, we are so grateful that you love us so much more. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. message this morning. Would you mind standing? I'm pressing on the upward way to heights I'm gaining every day still praying as I onward bound Lord thank my feet on higher ground Lord lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. And for those out in internet land, if you're looking and going, that kind of looks like Glenn, but he's got hair. It's not Glenn. <laughs> Love you, brother. It is indeed good to uh, be here this morning and that we can spend some time with not only each other, but with God and uh, to uplift and encourage each other. I've been struggling on what to do for this lesson, and I changed probably half a dozen times. In fact, my wife asked me at one point if I would do one that I did perhaps 15 years ago called Real Cowboys Don't Walk Home. Unfortunately, I can't find it, and so one of these days, maybe I'll get that one back together again. But this morning, I want to talk about a a heavy, heavy topic, and I think that all of you in some way or another will be able to relate to. The lesson is entitled, uh, Lessons in the Darkness. And I'd like to begin, open up with an interview that uh, Wayne Newton did in uh, USA Today, April the 17th, 1992. Quote, the script. The story goes that in his last engagement at the Las Vegas Hilton in December 1976, he kept a pad by his bed and wrote down his thoughts, Wayne Newton says. This one night he wrote especially personal thoughts, 
then crumpled it up and threw it away. Wayne says that an aide retrieved the note after he saw Elvis throw it away. When I asked the contents of it, Newton says, I was so moved that I purchased it. The lyrics or what was written. Elvis wrote, I feel so alone sometimes. The night is quiet for me. I'd love to be able to sleep. I am glad that everyone is gone now. I'll probably not rest tonight. I have no need for all of this. Help me, Lord. If you know the last couple years of Elvis' life, this explains a lot of what he was dealing with, and he was dealing with depression. And that's the topic that I want to talk about this morning. Newton went on and he wrote his own song, and perhaps some of you remember this. I actually went out to YouTube yesterday and I found it. The song is entitled, The Letter. And in it, he, he sings his own lines. And one of those was, as I awake, awake again today, and my pain won't go away. Towards the end of that song, he literally quoted what Elvis wrote. And it's really a powerful, powerful song. I wonder, has depression ever crept into your life? If it has, it can be devastating. This morning, I want to spend a little time, and I want to do, look at two things. I want to talk a little bit about depression itself, and then I want us to look at a prophet who dealt with depression. Let's go to Psalms 102. He opens up in Psalms 102, verse 1 says, A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Now the message in that first verse really boiled it down, and in the message it said, God, listen. Listen to my prayer. Listen to the pain in my voice. That was verse of the message. Beginning of verse 2, do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily, for my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and am like a sparrow alone on the housetop. My enemies reproach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me, for I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of your indignation and your wrath, for you have lifted me up and cast me away. My days are like a shadow that lengthens, and I wither away like grass. Dark times happen, and there's no reason to feel guilty about it. There were many men in the Bible that had difficult times. King Saul, he needed music to soothe his, his emotions. Elijah, he needed rest after his encounter with the prophets of Baal. Jesus, when we go into Mark, the 14th chapter, we see there that it says that he was overwhelmed when he was in the garden and he spent time with the father in prayer and there was Paul in his letters to Timothy he wrote to him he says everyone has deserted me he didn't write that one time he wrote that three times his way of coping was to ask that his parchments and his friends come to him when we look in history there was even those in history some giants in history that struggled with the depression as well Martin Luther, or I'm sorry, uh, Charles Spurgeon. On, on 1866, it was a Sunday morning, and it was at the London Metropolitan Tabernacle, he announced, I quote, I am the subject of depression of spirits so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. People were shocked. Charles Spurgeon was a giant in his time. At the, and, and in that Sunday, there was probably 5,000 people, and they were stunned by what he said. They couldn't imagine this giant of a man was suffering from depression. Martin Luther was subject to, of fits that were so bad that he would secret himself away for days. And his family would even so go, 
uh, go so far as to take dangerous items out of, away from him. One day, he, his wife Catherine came in, and um, she was wearing all black. And Martin asked her, "Who died?" And she said, "Looking at you, I may, I'm thinking that maybe God died." He was so depressed. If you ever get the chance to see that there was actual film of Martin Luther, and I was really impressed by what, the, what they did and the way they portrayed it. They did a very good job. But you know, there's a myth among Christians. There's a myth that, that says that Christians should always be happy, that we should always be content. And this uh, myth is based on the fact of the cross. People say, if Christ can die for you, why should you be feeling bad about anything? Look what he's done for you. That's a myth. And so what we do is, is we go around and we put this facade on and we don't share what we're struggling with and it begins to wear us down. The fact is that Christians do get depressed. And unfortunately, we put this message out there that you should be smiling and be joyful all the time because you are, in fact, a Christian. And that's a lie. It's an absolute lie. And the result is that people go around and they find their depression that much harder to bear because they are having to hide it from others. And not only are they having to carry that depression, hide it from others, but they're trying to put on this facade that I'm not depressed, that it's not an issue, and I don't want anybody to know anyway. So let's talk about depression. All of us face situational depression. Some of that could be the death of a loved one, or it could be a disappointment in life. Maybe you didn't make it as far along as your career. Maybe your career is not going as well as it should or you had, had expected. Or maybe it's a failure in your life that you're not making the money that you need for retirement or you were there at retirement and you're, you're not happy with that. Perhaps it's a spouse who has left the church or a child that's got in trouble. All of these are situational de uh, depression. Some of us, can, bat, can actually battle biological uh, depression. Doctors have found that when our bodies start getting out of kilter, that depression can come on for no situational reason. It's just that our bodies are out of whack. And it's our bodies telling us that, that things are off. There's also one other one. And Ann and I, we've, we've actually met in the, the state of Washington. And while we were there, we noticed something. Approximately, if memory serves me correctly, 265 days of the year in the state of Washington, it's either overcast and or raining. I spent a lot of months in the field soaking wet. When human beings go without a lack of sunshine, there's something that is called seasonal affective disorder. The sun's not there, and over time, they start to getting down. And perhaps some of you have experienced this in your past. Dark times can be devastating. I want to go back for just a moment with the scriptures that, that we just read, and I want to pull out some things here for you with what the, the psalmist wrote here. In verse 2, he said, or it, it seemed that God was so far away, he said, Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me. In the day that I call, answer me speedily. In verse 3, life seemed meaningless. Bones burnt. Perhaps it was from the ache of a fever. He just, didn't, he just did not feel well. He said, for my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burnt like a hurt. In verse 4, there's a lack of appetite and most likely a, a weight loss. He said, my heart is stricken and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. Verse 6, he felt alone. He said, I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. Verse 8, he felt persecuted. He felt rejected. My enemies reproach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me. And in verse 9, he experienced times of sadness and tears. He says, for I've eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. In verse 10, he was painfully aware of his food, and he actually felt tossed aside by God. He said, because of your indignation and your wrath, and you know this is not God, but the psalmist is saying, because of your indignation and wrath, and, and your wrath, 
for you have lifted me up and cast me away. Does that sound like some things, some of the things that you've experienced in your life? Dark times, though, can be dealt with. First, we have to come see that much of our reason we always see the worst in whatever scenario that we're looking at. I remember one time Mark Twain said that 90% of, of the 90% of the things that I worry about, only 10% of the things ever came true. And that is so true. It's not the circumstances that are depressing us. It is our response to them. In these times, we have to learn to dwell on, Lord's, on the Lord's goodness, not the world. We need to dwell on the Lord's goodness. Second, we have to develop a greater understanding of God's sovereignty. God is in charge. He knows what he's doing. He knows what's going to happen. And even when we don't understand, we have to trust him. We have to trust him. Sometimes we get so pig-headed, though, that we decide, you know what, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to do it on my own. And you know what God does? Fine, son, just go at it. Go full bore. And we keep on churning and churning, and we dig a hole deeper and deeper until finally we're just crushed. We're humbled. And then we start to come to our senses and say, you know what? I can't do this alone. I need God. And God does that sometimes. He just perfects us by the furnace. He just lets us burn for a while until we come to our senses. The third thing that we have to remember is, is that God loves us. In Isaiah, in uh, 61 verses 1 through, through 3, we're told that Jesus came to preach to the brokenhearted. Listen to what it says Verse 1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptance year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. God cares about us. He loves us so much that he sent his son to heal our heartaches. The fourth thing that we have to remember is that God is always, God is always, always true to his word. In Hebrews 13, 5, he says, For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And in Romans 8, 28, Paul wrote and told us that, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Brothers and sisters, God has no intention of ever breaking one of his promises. Not one of them. We have to trust him. And finally, we have to remember that God is preparing a place for us. He's preparing a place for those who that trust him. If you jump to the end of Psalms 102, you'll start to see where the, the darkness was lifting from him, the writer. He says, he strengthened my, he weakened my strength in the way. He shortened my days. I said, oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. The children of your servants will continue and their descendants will be st established before you. Can you feel the, the darkness there that was lifting from him? He, the psalmist gains pr perspective by reminding himself that this too shall pass. The only thing that is permanent is the Lord. And we, live, we will live in his presence if we maintain our faithfulness. And that is a fact that we can count on no matter how, what we feel emotionally. I want to give you a biblical example. To me, this is the most powerful example in Scripture of one who was dealing with depression. And I'm talking about Elijah. 
Now, we're going to go to uh, 1 Kings 19. But let me tell you a little bit what happened. Most of you probably already know, but for those who may not know, prior to this, uh, Elijah was dealing with Jezebel, and uh, there was, I believe, 450 priests of Baal. And if you remember, God decided he was just, basically he was just going to settle the score here and let them know who was God. It wasn't Baal, it was God. And so they actually put an altar out. I believe it was, it was uh, each one. Elijah had one altar, Baal had the other. They poured water on it, and uh, Baal's, the priest of Baal tried to call God or their God down to burn it. Nothing happened, and they did several things. Nothing happened. And so finally, Elijah prays, fire came down and consumed everything. And on that day, all 450 lost their lives that day. So that's what has happened. Which brings us up to 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 10. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals, and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, they've torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Our emotions are caused by our thoughts, and here are four causes of depression. From this, from this one here. First of all, we need to be focusing on facts and not on our feelings. In verse 3 and 4, it says, He arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. Elijah was scared, but he was focused on his feelings rather than what was going on. He felt like a failure, so he assumed he was a failure. In verse 4, don't compare yourself with others. Verse 4 it said, It is enough now, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. We fall into the trapping sometimes of, of, of saying, if, if I was like so-and-so, I'd be okay. I mean, look at them. Look at how good they're doing. Or look how successful they are. When we start comparing ourselves to others, we're going to be disappointed. And we're going to be depressed. We tend to compare our weaknesses with other people's strength, which is it's silliness to do that. In verse 10, he said, we, we, don't, we should don't take false blame. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. Elijah was blaming himself for negative events that was not his fault and that he did not have any control over. He blamed himself for failing to change the nation and in doing so, he took that really personally. We cannot assume the responsibility for other people's stupid decisions. And we need to remember that. Also, we be, need to be careful about don't, of not exaggerating the, the negative. In verse 10, he said, I alone left, and they seek to take my life. 
Elijah was having a pity party of one, and it was for Elijah only. He, the, only one, the only one that was person that threatened him was not really a threat. Think about it. Jezebel sent him a note and said, basically, I'm going to kill you. He got the message. Here's my question. Why didn't she just send an assassin and get it done with? I think there was some reasons for that. For one, I think she was, she was afraid she was going to make him a martyr. The other thing is, I think she knows what happened to those other 450 Baal priests, and it was probably not a good idea to be messing with Elijah. If he had stopped and thought about this, he would have had a different perspective on the situation. But instead, he had a pity party. And the other thing is, he says, I am now alone. I'm the only one. And yet, earlier, there was an angel that came to him, not once, but twice. He was never alone. God never left him. And that's something that we need to remember as well. God will never, never forsake us. He's there. He's there forever. Let's close. Are you prone to darkness? It's devastating. Sometimes those emotions can be so powerful that you can seem powerless to change, but we need to remember that there is a powerful God that can help you. Are you trusting him? Are you trying to do it on your own? If depression is persistent, if you've trusted him, if you've prayed and there's no changes, go see a doctor. It could be something physically wrong that's causing this depression. Because you can look around being depressed and go, I don't get it. Everything's good around me. Everything's going okay, but I'm depressed. It could be physical, folks. The lesson's yours. If you're struggling with depression, or maybe there's something else that you're struggling with, I want you to know that this body of believers, this body of believers is here, and they will level you. They care. Maybe you want to know, how do I become a Christian? We've got folks here that would be more than happy to share with you. Our elders are always available. They just need to know the situation. They're ready and they're able. I can assure you that. If, you, if, we, can be a, if we can be a servant in any way unto you, let us know. I hope this lesson has helped. I hope it's given you some thought. God bless you and stay safe. Walking in sunlight on my journey over the mountain through the deep vale, Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Sing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light in his no darkness, ever I'm walking close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I'm rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, rightly I'm walking, Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, 
Thank you, Jim, for that great sermon. Thank you, uh, Glenn, for the words at the table, and other Jim for the prayer. Thank you very much. Glad to see everybody here this morning, and uh, those who joined us on the internet. Thank you for that. As we come to a close, we'll close with a prayer and then a final song. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, Creator of all things, Master of the universe. Father, thank you for being our God. Father, help us to never forget that you're there. Sometimes, as Jim said in this, his lesson, that we tend to get depressed about things around us. We seem to get down on the littlest things. Father, help us to always look for the light, that the light is where we need to be and not in the darkness. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. We ask that our worship service this morning was pleasant to you and that we lifted each other up as well. Father, thank you for Jesus and his ultimate sacrifice, for we all know without that blood sacrifice we'd have no way home. Thank you so much for that. Be with us now as we depart. Help us to look for ways this week to find a way to share our faith. Look for ways to be the hands and feet of Jesus wherever we go, whatever we do. Again, thank you for Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Glad morning when the siren's o'er, I'll fly away, fly away, to a home, home God's celestial shore, I'll fly away, fly away, I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, fly away, when I die, hallelujah, bye and bye.